Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mike, for the very kind introduction. Thank you, Ron, as well, and uh, thank you, uh, Lee. It's always a pleasure to see Lee Moak uh, as a fellow uh, member of the Transportation Trades Department, and I appreciate his forthright and uh, uh, ability to call a spade a spade when we're sitting uh, in the AFL-CIO Transportation Trades Department. But what I'd like to speak to you uh, today is really all about regulation or a lack thereof and what has happened really internationally and to the uh, U.S. Merchant Marine. As, as Mike mentioned, I'm the president of Masters, Mates, and Pilots, and uh, when I say pilots, we're not talking about airline pilots, we're talking about har harbor pilots. And in fact, for many years, until the turnover of the Panama Canal, we represented the Panama Canal pilots. Our organization uh, goes back to 1887, and uh, it's interesting, and it has some bearing on, on the discussion today of, of why and how we were founded. Uh, we were founded really as a direct result of a boiler explosion on board a passenger excursion uh, steamer in Long Island Sound. The master, uh, a, a man by the name of Captain Charles Smith, uh, heroically uh, uh, steamed the vessel to a shallow waters where he was able to beach the vessel and most but not all the passengers were saved despite being engulfed in flames in the wheelhouse of the steamboat. Uh, shortly after he uh, was able to get off the vessel, both uh, Captain Smith and the chief engineer were arrested and charged with manslaughter. Uh, Captain uh, Smith died before he could be brought to trial, but it was local outrage uh, about the treatment of Captain Smith uh, in 1880 that finally led to the founding of Masters, Mates, and Pilots in 1887. And uh, what, what happened uh, in Masters, Mates, and Pilots really was uh, uh, illustrative of what was going on throughout the maritime industry at the time, both in the United States and, of course, around the world. But I was asked to speak about the impact of open international competition on U.S. maritime labor, and you could say really the same uh, impact is on uh, maritime labor, not only in the U.S., but the formerly leading maritime nations of the United Kingdom, Norway, Japan, the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, uh, you name it, uh, all sorts of, of nations with long and, and, uh, and proud maritime traditions that uh, beginning really as early in the 20s, but finally after the uh, end of the Second World War, uh, their flags, their flag states uh, became less and less important due to the phenomenon called the flag of convenience system. The flag of convenience system is dominated uh, and dominates uh, the international maritime trans transportation. Uh, what has happened, it's globalized the industry, and today maritime uh, was probably the first of all the industries to face global competition. Uh, it's all the result of a system that permits a country to open up its shipping register to ships owned by companies in other countries. So for an example, a U.S. company or a British company uh, can register their vessel under the flag of Liberia, Panama, the Bahamas, and by doing so, they can avoid many, uh, if not all, of the tax obligations and uh, many uh, of the regulatory requirements for labor, for safety, for environmental protection. Currently, there are 34 countries, primarily third world countries, uh, that have registry that are open to ships uh, regardless of the locale or the nationality of the owner. How did this system get started? Well, it was really all in reaction to regulation. Uh, like the boiler explosion in uh, Long Island Sound, uh, there was public outcry against uh, disasters that killed uh, innocent people. Uh, there was uh, a loss of life and there was a demand by American labor unions and other unions around the world to uh, regulate the industry. You see here a picture of really the, the founders of the first effective 
regulations in U.S. shipping. Uh, on the left here is a fellow by the name of Andrew Furiseth, who uh, was an austere Norwegian seafarer who came to the United States and became a champion of seamen's rights. His single-handed dedication to improving working conditions for seafarers led finally, after well over a decade of effort, to the establishment of the La Follette Seamen's Act of 1950. In the middle of that picture is Senator Robert La Follette, a famous progressive uh, politician from Wisconsin who uh, at one time ran for president in the early 1900s, as well as uh, Lincoln Steffens, who was a famous muckraker in uh, American history. But the La Follette Seamen's Act established the first uh, important regulations for U.S. maritime industry. They required seamen uh, to have uh, uh, work, regulated work hours, food, they had lifeboat requirements for the vessels, they had some inspection requirements and pro provisioning requirements, and they es uh, established the right of a, of a seafarer to leave the ship, leave employment without uh, being treated as a, as a desertion and subject the, the mariner to imprisonment. So for this, uh, Andrew Furiseth was called the Abraham Lincoln of the seas. But what he really did uh, was establish a, a regulatory system to protect mariners. And of course, in doing so, he uh, considerably raised the cost of uh, two American ship owners. One of the requirements in the Seamen's Act was that uh, uh, the 75 50 to 75% of the crew had to speak the same language as the officers, which ultimately meant that uh, U.S. citizens were required uh, in a large part of the crew uh, to enable the vessel to sail under the United States flag. About the same time, again, because of a series of des disasters, uh, sinkings, including the Titanic, but there were many, many more, uh, boiler explosions, founderings, uh, uh, loss of life at sea, primarily aboard passenger ships, which brought this to public attention. Uh, there were a number of, of regulations that were established, including hull and boiler inspections. Uh, the American Bureau of Shipping was charged with conducting these inspections at a regular basis. And again, this raised the cost to American ship owners. 1920, there was a famous Maritime Act passed the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, also known as the Jones Act. Well, among many other provisions, the Jones Act uh, allowed a certain number of surplus U.S. ships to be transferred to foreign registry. This was a result of a shipping glut. Uh, during the First World War, the uh, American Merchant Marine at the beginning of the war and leading up to the war was woefully inadequate and uh, our foreign trade was uh, really controlled and carried aboard foreign vessels. And as the war developed, uh, the United States engaged in a huge shipbuilding program. Most of these ships were not built until after the war. But nonetheless, after the war, the United States government through the War Shipping Board had uh, actually operated the vessels, uh, had a surplus tonnage, and started selling some of these vessels off. Uh, under the criteria that the vessels could not be sold uh, unless they were not in a competitive position to undermine uh, the uh, existing U.S. flag trades. So as a result of some of these, uh, these legislation, uh, including prohibition, which was another uh, uh, instance that encouraged uh, U.S. ship owners to look elsewhere to uh, fly their, their flag of their ship. Uh, prohibition in a very notable uh, 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 circumstance, uh, an American ship owner, uh, it, was, it was Avril Harriman, as a matter of fact, he owned two uh, large passenger vessels, and when prohibition came into effect, uh, he was told uh, under a, a, a regulation of the government that he could not serve alcohol aboard these passenger vessels, so he reflagged them to Panama and uh, under the Panamanian law, of course, uh, he, he could do whatever he wanted. And uh, 
although the, uh, the prohibition regulations were rolled back shortly thereafter, in fact, a year after he reflagged the vessels to the Panamanian flag, the Supreme Court of the United States said, well, outside of U.S. territorial waters, a U.S. flag vessel could serve alcohol. But nonetheless, these passengers' vessels stayed under Panamanian flag because it was quickly determined that they could save a lot of money on crew costs, on regulatory costs, and just uh, reduce uh, uh, their entire uh, burden of uh, federal compliance, including the payment of, of, tax, of federal taxes on their profits. As it became more apparent that uh, flagging in the flag of Panama uh, was an economic uh, advantage, uh, more uh, companies began to do so, although it's still in the 20s it was quite limited because under the regulations of the U.S. Shipping Board, uh, this could not be done again unless uh, you got approval from the board and unless the vessels being transferred would not be in competition with United States flag vessels in an existing trade. Other vessels uh, that were owned by U.S. companies, uh, primarily Standard Oil, New Jersey, Esso, and United Fruit Company, they had for several years owned vessels that were already under other flags, the flag of the United Kingdom uh, and the flag of what was then uh, became the, the free city of Danzig. And uh, for various reasons, these two companies decided uh, to reflag their vessels uh, to the Honduras and Panamanian flag. And uh, again, they had no problem doing so because uh, from the flag of Britain or the case of Danzig, they could do so without any uh, uh, requirement to, for permission from the United States government. But the outcomes of this, uh, these transfers and, and others in the 20s, uh, it became clear that they could avoid U.S. Siemens Act requirements, they could hire multinational crews, they could avoid U.S. construction and inspection requirements, and they could pay lower, form, uh, lower uh, foreign seamen's wage scale. At the time, the lowest wage scale, uh, particularly on the West Coast, was a Japanese wage scale, and uh, it was a fraction of what the, what the American wage scale was at the time. I love this quote because it really is all you really need to, to say about the flag of convenience system. Uh, and I'm going to read it. Uh, it's by, it was stated by uh, Congressman Robert Bacon, a uh, congressman from New York in 1922. And he says, the real difficulty in starting an American merchant marine is first the La Follette Bill, which insists upon one half to two thirds of the deck and engine departments being composed of American citizens. Second, all sorts of interference by government and labor unions, the eight hour day, et cetera. And third, the captain should be in absolute control of his ship, three miles from shore. It would take so long to convince any collection of politicians of these facts that a simple demonstration would be to sell a number of our ships with the privilege of allowing the owners to sail them under the Panama flag. The ships could then be run on the same plane as our old merchant marine, unhampered by labor unions and, quote, sea lawyers, unquote, and when the captain called any or all hands, there would be no question of overtime. What more can you say? As the flag of convenience system developed, uh, countries who were flag of convenience registries, they viewed ship registration as a source of revenue rather than as a means of effective national regulation of shipping. So for example, uh, one a country would lower its rate uh, and provide less regulation than another in order to attract uh, registration of, of shipping to its registry. There is, to this day, considerable competition among flag of convenience countries to attract shipping companies to their registry based on low manning levels, low national regulatory standards, lax enforcement of international standards, and freedom from taxation on income of owners and crew. In fact, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, as some of the flag of convenience countries have been under pressure to improve standards uh, because of various disasters that have taken place, uh, other countries have popped up. So there's always another country with lower standards. So for a substandard ship owner, if the regulations are enforced uh, to a larger degree in one flag of convenience registry, uh, the owner can easily and readily transfer to a registry that has less stringent requirements. 
a ship owner under a flag of convenience flag enjoys all the rights under international law of a ship flying the flag of a sovereign nation with none of the obligations of national taxes or national laws that protect labor and social conditions. It is not surprising that the vast majority of shipping companies in international trades operate under flag of convenient registries to avoid national taxation and regulation. The United Nations Convention on Trade and Economic Development estimates that more than 73% of the world fleet is registered in flag of convenience countries. This number continues to grow. So what you see here is a situation where 73% of world shipping is now registered uh, in flag of convenience nations uh, away from the traditional maritime nations and of course with the uh, resulting effect for the labor sources in those countries. What you see here is a list of the 34 countries that have been deemed flag of convenience countries by the ITF. The ITF is the International Transport Workers Federation, which is an independent uh, group of trade unions that have banded together since 1896 to try to establish labor standards uh, internationally. Uh, these uh, countries, and you see some familiar names here, uh, are the countries where ship owners can go to avoid duties and responsibilities and to, to play uh, one set of regulations off against another when uh, one register becomes more stringent than another. So for example, on this list, you'll see uh, Cambodia, you'll see Mongolia, you'll see Malta, you'll see uh, Antigua and Barbuda, and some of these countries are notorious for their lack of enforcement of, of, of international conventions on safety at sea and for uh, uh, failure to regulate the vessels that are under their registry. The impact of the flag of convenience system on U.S. international trade, and this, this uh, again tells you all you really need to know, the total number of ships in the United States international trade coming in and out of U.S. ports, 7,836 vessels. The number of U.S. ships in U.S. international trade, 89 ships at last count. Now, when I started uh, in the Merchant Marine, we had approximately, which was in the mid-70s, we had approximately 1,000 ships under U.S. flag, uh, both in uh, international trade and in a domestic Jones Act trade, these are deep sea ships. Today, we have 89 ships in international trade and about 100 ships in domestic trade. So in, in a course of about 30 years, we've gone from 40 years, uh, we've gone from uh, well over 1,000 ships to a couple of hundred ships. Percentage of port calls by U.S. ships, 1.5% of the ships calling in U.S. ports are U.S. flagged. Uh, further, the percentage of trade carried aboard U.S. vessels uh, is less than 2%. The United States is now the second uh, greatest trading na nation. China has overtaken us, but less than 2% of our foreign trade is carried aboard U.S. flag vessels when over 90% of the foreign trade of the United States is carried by sea. The small numbers of U.S. ships that do exist are not in open competition, but survive through subsidies or cargo preference programs established under a government policy to maintain a core base of maritime skills and ships to serve national security interests. And again, uh, you know, in talking uh, or trying to figure a strategy uh, for the survival of, of our industry, uh, we, I have always personally felt that the economic argument was stronger, that a nation that's dependent on trade should not be dependent on foreign carriers to carry that trade, that the value and the balance of payments uh, by, uh, by increasing revenue through the carriage of cargo in and out of ports is of a national asset. But the economic argument for the U.S. Merchant Marine has never really resonated with the politicians uh, and with the executive offices of the United States. But what has resonated and what has kept us alive uh, to this point is the national security argument. 
Obviously, the experiences of the First World War, the Second World War, and the various conflicts since that time uh, necess necessitate a minimum capacity of uh, U.S. vessels uh, to carry uh, equipment and logistical support uh, for, the, for, the, for defense. And the same is true of other nations, uh, but the, the policies uh, vary uh, dramatically. These are the top 10 seafare nationalities. And uh, I don't have the numbers printed out there, and the numbers change every year. But the, the bottom line is that uh, there always is a, a quest for a lower, lower cost labor. Uh, for many years, the Philippines provided the, the bulk of uh, unlicensed ratings. Uh, these are seamen, uh, cooks, engine room workers. Uh, but the Philippines uh, became too expensive. They're still one of the largest producers of, of labor, suppliers of labor, but uh, then the, the, the ship owners and ship management firms migrated to China. And when China became too expensive, now a large source of labor is uh, Myanmar and, and Burma. So as you can see, there's a constant uh, move to find a, a cheaper source of labor. With the uh, collapse of the economies in Eastern Europe, uh, many of the uh, licensed officers uh, come from Poland, Russia, Croatia, and these sources of labor uh, where the, the cost is, of course, less than hiring officers uh, from the UK or Norway or the United States, Japan, or, or, or other first world nations. Here's a list of the top 15 beneficial owners globally. And these are the countries that actually, citizens of these countries own the vessels. So many of the traditional maritime nations are still on this list because the owners reside in these countries. Greece, Japan, Germany, United States, United Kingdom, Norway, Denmark. A, a lot of these nations are the traditional nations. But when you look at the registrations, it's a different story. The top 15 flags of registration, Panama is number one, Liberia, and the mighty Marshall Islands. Uh, Bahamas, Malta, Cyprus, the Isle of Man, and then uh, at the bottom there's Norway's second registry, which is called NIS, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But as you can see, those top three nations, Panama, Liberia, and Marshall Island, they, they control roughly 40% of world shipping. And uh, needless to say, uh, the standards, although some of the standards are, are, are quite high in some of the Liberian or Marshall Islands vessels, they avoid the taxation requirements and many of the regulatory requirements that uh, first world traditional maritime nations would require. What does the flag of convenience mean to seafarers? Often unsafe vessels, aging badly and not maintained to basic safety levels, unprotected seafarers in the event of injury or death, Wages often go unpaid with little or more recourse to the seafarer. Anyone who lives in a, in a major port, I'm sure, is, has read about cases where ships are essentially stranded in port. The owners have disavowed knowledge of the vessel, and uh, you're le left with a crew there often without substance, subsistence and without sometimes even passports that are stranded in these ports. Seafarers around the world often undervalued, treated poorly, and Insecure work agreements is the order of the day. Most seamen around the world uh, are hired by ship management firms, crewing agents. Uh, they have uh, 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 single, uh, uh, single employee contracts, uh, work agreements. If they don't complete their assignment, they don't get the, the full pay. If they don't complete nine months of employment, they don't get their, the, what they call a bonus or a vacation pay at the end of it. And uh, they're subject uh, really to, to the whims of the labor market in that particular management firm or that particular labor supply company. And here's the impact. In a, in a multinational playing field where there are few restrictions on moving assets or operations between nations, companies will shift operations to the country with the lowest taxes and wages and the least regulations. The competitive advantage of flag of convenience vessels in avoiding national taxes and labor standards creates an environment where regulated and taxed national shipping companies and labor cannot survive in an unregulated free global market. Other social and legal factors that are particular to U.S. labor in competing on the, on the international market 
is uh, many e you know, United uh, Common Market countries uh, exempt uh, common market officers from taxes. EU officers are covered under, often under national health care programs and national pension programs. So for U.S. labor to compete in this, in this sector, uh, benefit costs are, are one of the, the major hurdles. So often in, in this time, although our wages may be able to com compete with officers from uh, the U.K. or Norway, our benefit costs uh, make us uncompetitive. Uh, and also our legal regime, uh, which gives us uh, more legal rights in the case of personal injury and, and other uh, contractual remedies are, are often what uh, have kept the U.S. from competing on, in a global labor market. The flag of convenience system created an industry outside of national regulatory control, resulting in a large number of substandard ships and crews in international trade. The response has been a move towards greater international regulation of shipping under the United Nations organizations. So really what we have now in the international maritime world is international regulation by default. Because national states uh, have either uh, given up their national flags and, and ship owners have, have fled for one reason or another to flag of convenience countries who don't regulate shipping, the arena for regulation has changed to the international arena. And it's become a critical arena and some positive things have been accomplished uh, internationally. But the, the bottom line is uh, the, the overall standards in first world countries have gone down and there's a low, much, much lower baseline that is arguably uh, enforced or not enforced depending on the port state that various vessels uh, visit. One of the uh, quote unquote benefits of flag of convenience uh, system is concealed ownership. Flags of convenience system allows shipping companies to establish complex ownership structures that are characterized by a lack of administrative and managerial accountability and transparency. Corporate structures are often multi-layered, spread across numerous jurisdictions, and may make the beneficial owner almost impenetrable to law enforcement officers and taxation. This facilitates not only, of course, the, the basic tax dodging, but criminal activity, avoidance of environmental and resource protections, particularly in the fishing industry, you'll see this flag of convenience vessels illegally fishing in, in various areas uh, where they cannot be brought to justice because of the identity of the ownership cannot be found. And there is uh, a potential for terrorism, which of course is something that we would have in common with the, with the airline industry. Uh, there is a potential not only for smuggling and transporting personnel or potential uh, uh, devastating uh, uh, biological or, or nuclear uh, weapons on board a container ship uh, but there's, or any other type ship, but also uh, there has been concern that a, an oil tanker or an LNG carrier could be used uh, as a weapon in and of itself. Because of the, the lack of regulation, uh, on the international scale and the various disasters that occurred in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, there became a, a call for, for more international regulation because of the, the lack of regulation by countries uh, such as the ones in this, in this picture. I'm sure many here have heard of the, the Torrey Canyon disaster off the coast of Cornwall. Uh, the Prestige in Spain, and Amoco Cadez and the Erica off Brittany, these environmental disasters uh, created a call for more effective regulation. But this regulation was done on the international scale and some of the countries in question, for example, Liberia and, uh, the, and the Marshall Islands did in fact improve the quality of their, of their uh, regulations or their inspection system and their licensing system as a, as a result which forced some of the low budget uh, ship owners to lesser flags that had less stringent requirements. At the end of the day, uh, we all know here in this room, we're fighting uh, globalization. You think about uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership or the Free Trade Agreement, the Transatlantic uh, Partnerships, these free trade uh, 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 negotiations and treaties uh, are, are a dagger uh, uh, pointed at our heart, and uh, uh, the the, ben the quote unquote benefits of globalization uh, versus the 
the high cost of national regulation uh, and, and the ability for uh, the powers that be to, to play off uh, the cost and benefit analysis uh, to the detriment of labor and to the detriment of national security and, and social rights and human rights in some cases uh, is what we have to deal with. Tax avoidance, choice of regulatory compliance based on the choice of flag of convenience country, avoidance of labor and social benefit obligations, reduced cost of operations, registry fees, expenses, privacy of ownership. Uh, this is all uh, viewed by some as a positive. And uh, of course the mantra is cheap shipping. And uh, this keeps the maritime major, the major maritime powers complicit in this system. If the major maritime powers uh, wanted to put this away, they could have done so many years ago in the late 40s. There were some efforts to do this, but the, the, uh, the maritime trading nations are complicit with this because they still have uh, great moneyed interest in ship ownership and they're free of the national regulations. So by default, responsibility has been delegated to international regulation organizations, port states. These port states are states that have the right under these treaties to inspect vessels coming into their ports. Insurance, protection, and indemnity clubs that provide underwriting insurance, uh, classification societies, and in some cases, ship owner clubs that have an interest in seeing the standards not go too far down so they don't fall under uh, national uh, regulation, but maintain them at a certain baseline so they avoid further scrutiny uh, because uh, they're avoiding uh, public relations disasters in doing so. The International Maritime Organization, the IMO, is a key organization that establishes safety standards for the operation of ships and for the training and certification standards of crews. Again, this is an international body. Uh, it's part of the United Nations. Uh, our uh, chief effort uh, on the international uh, arena, the regulatory arena, is uh, through our participation at the IMO. Uh, we are members of the International Transport Workers Federation, which as I mentioned is a global federation of labor unions, but by virtue of that membership, we also have a seat at the table of the International Maritime Organization where we try uh, to always to, to enhance the standards, prevent the watering down of, of licensing requirements, uh, safety requirements, and although progress is in the words of, of our chief uh, regulatory uh, 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 official, progress is glacial, there has been some progress. We have raised the baseline of standards by participating not only in the IMO, but also the International Labor Organization. There was a major uh, step in the right direction. Uh, in 2006, the Maritime, Labor of, the Maritime Labor Convention was established that set baseline industry standards internationally for seafarers. This only came into effect in August of 2013, and some countries, many countries in fact, including the United States, did not ratify this, but uh, it has been, we think it will be effective in at least bringing up baseline standards. Uh, as stated on the slide, <clears throat> these organizations have no means to directly regulate, but they provide a forum for drafting of international documents, conventions, and treaties. The signatory countries then have a treaty obligation to bring their national laws into conformity with the conventions. So often what will happen is progress will be made at the international level and then the United States Coast Guard in the case of the US or the other national uh, inspection agencies will be required to uh, inspect vessels and enforce these uh, to whatever measure the, the national uh, port state control agency uh, deems fit. And uh, as, as part of this, uh, the IMO has a, is a function of the United Nations Convention for the Law of the Seas. And under this convention, uh, there's what is called generally accepted international rules and standards. And I won't read this, but what it, what it says basically is that uh, even if the nation's, this flag state uh, doesn't agree or have signed on to some of these conventions, generally accepted international rules and standards uh, need to be uh, applied 
and if they're in a port state that has signed on to these conventions, that particular port state may inspect and may detain vessels that do, do not comply with these generally accepted international rules and standards. What this means is often the most substandard vessels and the most atrocious uh, conditions are often on vessels that do not call in first world ports. So they avoid this, uh, this obligation. In, in one of the, the, the studies that I, I've read about the, uh, international regulation and the flag of convenience system, what has happened, you might think that this is a race to the bottom. Well, in a sense, it really isn't a race to the bottom. It's a race to somewhere between the bottom and the middle. Uh, that doesn't give us any comfort because the traditional maritime nations always had high standards and want to maintain the highest standards. But what the international regulation has meant is the bottom is not, is not uh, internationally acceptable, but somewhere between the middle and the bottom uh, seems to be where this is, this is led. As far as unionization, the rights of labor to organize in unions is a matter of national legislation. There is no right for a national union to organize labor on a ship under the flag of another country. The International Transport Workers Federation has a campaign to organize labor on flag of convenience vessels. Such organizing is neither assisted nor supported by any national or international labor laws. So I, I can tell you that uh, uh, in the United States, when the flag of convenience uh, problem became very clear after the end of the Second World War, there were uh, strong efforts uh, by U.S. labor to organize a uh, flag of convenience vessels that were beneficially owned. Uh, there was picketing, there were labor stoppages, uh, and at, at, some, at various points, uh, we had American labor had gotten traction within the National Labor Relations Board, but finally a Supreme Court decision came out in 1963 that said, regardless of the balance of contacts between the owner and the, and the, and the, uh, the uh, country uh, where the labor union or the, the, uh, that was trying to organize was from, uh, as long as that flag on the stern was not of the same country, there was no right to organize that vessel. Consequently, the efforts to organize have been on the international level with the International Transport Workers Federation. The initial goal of the International Transport Workers Federation was to force flag of convenience vessels back to the nation state of beneficial ownership, where there was a genuine link between the owner and the flag of the country. Uh, this effort started in 1948. About 10 years later, in 1958, uh, there were international boycotts and picketing uh, blockades, essentially, of vessels uh, around the world. Some two or three hundred vessels uh, were, were held up in port. Uh, this, of course, would never have happened without the cooperation of the longshore, the dockers' unions, the dockers and the seafarers from uh, first world countries such as Norway, uh, the Nordic nations particularly were strong, the United States, the UK, there was an international effort in the 50s to try to do something about this. So it isn't a case where the maritime industry and the labor was not aware of what was happening. They were aware of it, but they were constrained legally. They were constrained by their ability to, to accomplish their ends. After about 20 years of effort, 30 years of effort in the International Transport Workers Federation of trying to force a uh, flag of convenience back to the original beneficial ownership state by picketing vessels and stopping them until they signed uh, what they called standard agreements, it became apparent that this effort was failing, that countries would sign standard agreements, but they weren't going back to the flag of original ownership. And therefore, the, the efforts of the international transport workers became geared less towards <clears throat> trying to force uh, ownership back to the flag state of, of ownership and more towards improving the standards and conditions of the seafarers on board those vessels. Now this was a positive thing obviously for the seafarers on those vessels, but it did nothing uh, of course for the officers and the ratings from those original uh, countries that, that had lost their jobs. There also developed 
some at, at various points rifts between the licensed officers and the ratings unions in, in these countries, uh, particularly in countries uh, like uh, the United Kingdom and Norway, Denmark, they established uh, France, they established uh, second registries. These second registries were uh, still officially the flag of the of the original ownership nation, for example, the Norwegian International Registry, but they changed the labor uh, requirements and some of the regulatory requirements and the taxation requirements, so they became essentially a, a flag of convenience by another name. Some of the officers' unions were enamored of this because the original promise was, well, the officers would keep their jobs aboard these vessels and it would just affect the ratings. Uh, but ultimately, in almost every case, what started out uh, as second registries with certain standards uh, to maintain national officers on board, these standards have, have almost, without an exception, gone away, and now these second registries are almost identical to flag of convenience vessels. There are approximately 80,000 ships in the world fleet, and those numbers are, are counted. Every time you read a statistic, it's somewhat different. Uh, somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000 ships in, in, a, in a flag uh, in, in, in an international trade. Uh, it is said that 73 percent of the world fleet operates under flag of convenience system. The ITF has organized under labor collective bargaining agreements about 12,300 ships, which is a relatively small proportion but it is really quite an achievement when you consider the, the arena that they've been operating in. Somewhere between 10 and 25 percent of crews at any given time may be covered by a, an ITF uh, collective bargaining agreement. And uh, one thing that, that gives me pause, because I just came from an International Transport Workers Federation meeting in London, if you consider that this 25 or 15 percent, 10 percent was basically achieved uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s when labor had much greater strength and when the, the, the forces uh, promoting globalization were weaker, it gives you concern to say, how can we sustain this? How can we sustain some kind of international organizing of labor? Uh, so by default, again, we fall back to international regulation, uh, which is, is uh, ultimately cuts out the nationals of the nations of, of beneficial ownership. Of course, FOC and aviation, uh, obviously you guys are struggling with this now, and, and uh, I was able to, to hear uh, Lee uh, at the latest TTD speak eloquently on, on what you guys are facing. Uh, certainly, when you consider the, the European Union and that uh, uh, Malta and Cyprus, particularly Malta, which is a notorious flag of convenience nation uh, in shipping, uh, when they're trying to do the same in aviation, it certainly uh, gives pause for concern uh, that airlines would migrate to the least taxed, least regulated, lowest wage cost countries. And, you know, what does this mean for protection of wages, benefits, and social conditions? On top uh, of this, you've got to deal with how to combat this. And, uh, you know, I think the only way is through cooperation on both the national level between the various unions, the political level in the, in the nation, but also obviously internationally. And, and I salute you for what you're doing. Uh, and, and I think that this battle is, is something that is, is not going to go away. And, and uh, you know, I have a, a quote here from, uh, from Andrew, Andrew Furiseth. And uh, he was the, the guy who was responsible for the founding of the, the Siemens Act, the La Follette Act in 1915 in the States. And I think it, it, it resonates because what he said is, you can put me in jail, but you cannot give me narrower quarters than as a seaman I have always had. You cannot give me coarser food than I have always eaten. You cannot make me any lonelier than I always have been. And what he was fighting in 1915 is what we're fighting on an international level here in 2013 for seamen of the world. He was trying to maintain these standards and regulations uh, for American seafarers to preserve the occupation and, and the, the profession 
of, of seafarers. And today with the Maritime Labor Convention of 20, 2006, which is just going into effect, just went into effect last year, that same battle is ongoing. And it's not going to end. It's constant. In the United States, uh, we, we allied uh, with, with our, our employers and with labor to try to press for the preservation of our industry. I think aviation has to do the same. And I think we have to do the same on the international level through, through regulatory action, through militant action whenever we can do that, and through solidarity with each other. And it is a daunting task. And uh, believe me, I wish I had answers, but I salute your efforts to meet together, and I appreciate the invitation. Originally, I thought I was going to be flying to Panama City, Florida, but here I am. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to meet you all. So thank you very much.